So I did understand I will have to speak mostly to a lot of students, which is uh, true. And uh, I decided to select during uh, my 30 years of work, or maybe more, um, projects that could be, I think, um, hopeful for students. So how the profession is evolving will be main part of what I will show. Uh, so, I st no, no, no introduction in reality. So, I studied natural sciences and um, I was very interested in natural mechanism, like in geology. And when I started, not really when I started, but being a landscape architect, I'm fascinated in interactions between natural phenomenon, like erosion, and constructions. And I guess everybody being on a beach along the sea would have had this impression of, you know, the way these wooden poles are interacting with currents and alluvion. So it could sound a little bit stupid, but this is exactly what, uh, why I'm a landscape architect. I really love when some construction really interact with a natural phenomenon. Like being on a bridge, when you see um, the column of a bridge and behind it a kind of island with alluvion that are deposited by both current and construction. Okay, it will be clearer later. And so at the late, during the late 80s, <coughs> I was at Villa Medici in Roma. And I spent years, I'm serious about this, doing these kind of models in concrete and sand with water stream, trying to play with this interaction between constructions and nature. So literally creating a flush, a flux of water and sand and observing all these shapes created by these kind of very elementary constructions. At this time, at this late 80s, we didn't have Google. And um, I used, you know, satellite views from the army, mostly, where we could do this kind of very simple mapping, very elementary, of currents, stream, rivers. And it is very important to be said that I do think hand drawings are very important. You know, like in sciences even today, if you draw by hand, you just understand the shapes, the proportions, and the rules. And this was another drawing. And you can recognize, again, you should, I mean, I do understand that for students it's very strange to hear this, but there was no Google Earth. It was very hard to find aerial pictures. Only on touristic uh, books you could find a view from the sky or kind of artist. And so we found satellite views at this time. And you know, on the square, on the left side of the picture, you have a city, an arbor, and again the way piers, constructions, interact with the flux of a river. Again, when late, late 80s, this is a drawing, it took me one month to do it. It, it is big, by the way, it's uh, 1.6 meter per side. And it requires some imagination from you, but it's a valet. In this valet, I imagine, I was thinking about object, concrete blocks, <coughs> that were creating at any flood island, this was the purpose, and this island would be cleared by flux from dams. Dams are these black lanes. So I do not say too much, but this drawing is part of the Modern Art Museum collection today. And I must say, when I did it, artists were not convinced by my technique. This was a very, very slow technique. One month to do it was ridiculous. But I think this is interesting because during this month I had time to, I don't know why, to, to think about it maybe. Okay, I don't remember why I did this, but. 
So very luckily, <coughs> immediately after, I met Renzo Piano for different reasons. And he asked me to think about a possible garden on the north of the Adriatic, close to Trieste, um, where there is a tide. By the way, this morning I was in uh, Venice, where there is a very high tide. And um, idea, this was an abandoned quarry where Renzo Piano had to build uh, an hotel. And we thought that we could play with this small tide in the north of the Adriatic to capture water and to organize pools. Again, interaction between constructions and natural phenomenon. So it's probably easier to look at this on these models, where you could see so the Renzo Piano's hotel like an amphitheater and uh, these kind of dams dealing with tide and and a surgeon that will help flush alluvions sometimes. This has not been built, or only in part. <coughs> and also, more recent project that play with the same kind of thing. It requires a little bit of attention, it's complicated. Um, this has been done for Biennale in Rotterdam, but it's a serious study for the state. Um, like a key black corresponds to river, the rain and the Meuse. Um, gray corresponds to agriculture, dark gray to city, brown to new city, and I will explain what the white is. And the purpose of this exhibition was flood, but we still paradoxically opposed uh, purposes, how to make the city grow, how to add new inhabitants, and how to give more rooms for water. So I spent some time on this drawing to explain this. Today, in the Netherlands, like in a lot of countries, rivers have been contained between dikes. And so water is concentrated on the riverbed between dikes. When there is a lot of water, which is happening more and more, of course, it's, it's a nightmare. It's, you, you know what I mean. So here the purpose was to say, we will give more room to water and more room to city. And what we did is a little bit strange, and you will more understand what I'm trying to do. The white on this plan corresponds to former riverbeds before the main rivers were contained by dikes. And it's strange, but the riverbed were carrying sand. They are uncompactable. Everything else, when it dries, goes down. This happens in a lot of countries where there are dikes. And as a paradox, the riverbeds are higher than the land. And so we decided to destroy the dikes around the main rivers and to, to put the material on top of the former white riverbeds. So it's a reverse landscape where riverbeds are new dikes. In such a way, there is a lot of room for water or the gray parts. And there is a lot of room on top of the new dikes to build a city, the brown. So it's a reverse landscape that works. And it could sound totally nuts, but it works. Okay, and so this is um, a kind of um, model that shows both city and flood and some dikes. And again, this is so I'm saying that because it's important to give some hope for students to students. This, is, this has been exposed to the Louisiana and is part of the modern art uh, collection in Paris. So, we are back to the 90s and Richard Rogers uh, asked me to do something on the Greenwich Peninsula for a Millennium Park. We, we had a very short time to do it and we built a park that has to be present immediately and it's a kind of micro wood and a series of clearings. I don't comment too much, but technically it's on top of a very polluted area. It's very complicated, but you don't really care. Okay, so clearing and wood. But what was important is this was a prefiguration. We did it for the millennium. And today, this is an area that is in construction. 
probably you know this Richard Rogers Dome on this Greenwich Peninsula close to London. <coughs> and interestingly, all this landscape architecture gave quality to a place that today becomes a real development of London. And this was sort of new, I mean, large prefiguration parks. And, um, and speaking now about Montpellier, and it helps me introduce the idea of time. And we started with another landscape architect, Christine Dalnokis's work in 90, 91. And I will speak about it because we are still working in it 20, you know, 30 years after, quite. So time management is key and large surfaces as well. We first won a competition to reorganize a motorway that um, drives people to the city center. It was a three kilometers long way. We, have, we had to double it. And we were very young, so no culture at all. But we did, we didn't know we were doing that, a kind of parkway. So we gave room to some plantings between the street, between the lane, around the way, on a narrow landscape, and we planted 14,000 pine trees, only pine trees. And if today it's a little bit better, of course, 30 years are nothing for such a project. And three kilometers, if you drive 60 kilometers per hour, corresponds to a three minute landscape, which is a small wood to go in a city. So a single landscape, a unity. I'm saying that because all other competitors organized it with sequences, diversity, uh, as very complicated. We just made a wood, a three minutes long wood. Then maybe you see this map on the corner on the so this is important for students as well. I'm back to this one. The red for every picture corresponds to what we, are, what we see. But we convinced the mayor at this time that he should organize the landscape of the development of its city. And he agreed. And we didn't know how to do it, to be honest. But this is very big. It's three kilometers long per two. <coughs> and all the drawings have been done first by Ricardo Bofil. To be honest, we didn't have any possibilities to modify all this drawing because it corresponded to ownership, to properties. But we decided to have a very precise palette for with two reasons, it's a little bit complicated. When it's going horizontally, which is east-west, um, it corresponds to a certain palette. When it's north-south, it corresponds to rivers and another palette. And during quite 30 years, we have been very, very precise with this. So every project to any scale had to respect this very precise palette. So you know if you are going on an agricultural direction, east-west, or if you are going north-south to the sea, according to natural geography. And at the very end, it starts to be readable. So these are examples. This is a park. And east-west corresponds to agriculture, poplars. We will see north-south after. Just a, a word about this kind of park. It's a very poor park. And it took us 20 years to, to do it, and it is not completed yet. So I'm speaking about time management, which is key in our profession. It makes no sense to try to make a park from nothing completed for the first year. We did this park by layers. First, grading, because this is a reservoir. It's a place where there are big floods. Then we have first trees. Slowly shrub, slowly path, slowly meadow, etc., etc. Only at the very late stages are coming more furnitures, more sport activities, equipment. I really like to conceive a park by layers during time. 
you will see more. This is another part of this development. It is with Christian de Porzamparc, a French architect, and it's just a kind of announcement of countryside. A recent project on the same area, which is a reservoir. You will see that with, maybe in part, climate change, we have to deal with a natural phenomenon, flood being one of the more difficult uh, story. And this is a small park, a few hectares, I don't remember, and it's just a kind of, we are digging a very big pit, and water will come from the bottom, from these kind of rocks. So this is a normal period, and this is when it flood. Just to say that it's not easy sometimes to finance a park, but there are needs like water management, water treatment, ecological compensations, and you will see that a lot of projects are using these tools to, to pay the construction of a park. Okay, so I'm going through a lot of projects. If it's too much, one should help me uh, finish. So this is in Lyon, you know the city in the center of France, and this is a project we are still developing with Herzog et de Meuron, Swiss architect. It is along two rivers, and unfortunately we couldn't move the river edges. We want to bring back in the city some prisons of the river edge, but these ones are built, and nobody could afford the destruction of what has been built before. This is something important, we will see it later. I mean, today, luckily, we are all refurbishing industrial and harbor structures to densify our city centers. But the means that corresponds to industry are huge compared to the means we have to build public spaces. So we could have some means to do a public space, but we will never have means to destroy industrial structures. I hope this is understandable. So we have to keep the K and we bring nature inside. Because of course we wanted to bring you know, what of, um, sorry, what of movement according seasons and all the flower that is developed along the shore. Okay, so this is done. Other parts with river, so water management again. Do not comment too much. Now I will see you something. So again, it is about time management and large-scale projects. So again, I repeat the title, it's Transforming Territories. And in Bordeaux, which is known for the wine, but it's a big city, it's a large landscape. And we first were commissioned to build a chart for public spaces. As in every city, they suffered from a huge diversity in projects. You know, everybody comes with his own fantasy and you cannot know if you are in Bordeaux or Lyon or Praga. Or oh, Prague, sorry. So, so um, we had to do a chart to give rules, common rules, a language for everything on landscape architecture in this very large territory. The map corresponds to, I don't remember, but sorry, I'm looking to see, it's maybe like, a square corresponds to one kilometer. I don't know if you see the squares. And, um, but I don't like rules. So we decided as a method to work, to work sorry, by prototypes, mock-up. <clears throat> and every month with the city, we did a mock-up, a project, and all the project together is a shot. It's very important because I've been developing this in very big cities after, not only Bordeaux, but Toulouse, Marseille, and a lot of cities. So um, sometimes we are stuck by regulation processes which are not interesting. We should work with prototype, with very concrete uh, approaches. So we had to work. The red corresponds to new planting. And um, Slowly, we, we, it was sort of an evidence for us that we should have to improve the presence of the landscape along the river. And we convinced the mayor, that I will show later, 
that along the river he should not build and instead he has to build a park. I will repeat this sometime during the lecture. I'm very influenced by landscape architecture in the US at the end of the 19th century and by park systems. In the US, of course, from the end of the 19th century, this river would have been organized with a park along it. This was not the case in our countries. And um, this is something we have to do today, to bring a presence of nature along natural geography in cities. So, just some example about the way we deal with this city and this chart. This is a prototype we did on a very big car park. In France, like everywhere in Europe, we have been building these very big, very large commercial areas with huge car park. Today, we know we will have to transform them. And as a mock-up, we found a way to reorganize this car park, not destroying it, because nobody can afford it today. We just dyed tranchées in which there is a mixture of stone and earth and plantings. If you just put a tree on a car park, of course, it will immediately die, as you know. So this is a technique from the US to have both a fertile soil, drainage, and not destroying the car park. And this is a picture a few years after the way it worked, so it was uh, interesting. Firstly, we had to build a big, not a big, we had to build a stadium with Herzog de Meuron on this very place. And so we used our technique to build the parvis of this stadium. So this mock-up was in a way useful. We reopened river, not river, channels. I'm back to the city center in Bordeaux. And so while we were trying to convince the mayor to make a park, we did ourselves drawings, and this drawing was exposed to the MoMA. And um, it was just to say, there was no availability on this land. There was a kind of old industry, and we proposed that any time there was an available parcel, it could be planted. So again, this is a time management process. The purpose is to build a large park along the river, but nobody can afford it and the land was not available. So it's a succession of small parks dealing with all availabilities, all opportunities. <clears throat> and we made this drawing. It's like incremental, this, if this is English, you know, so it's a kind of progression. So during years, you have more and more parcels. And it means that it's not seen like a fake nature. It is an addition of, of artifices. What will look natural is a dimension along a river. And so this happened like six, seven years ago, and slowly we are planting this very simple plant. You know, it's not a park at the end. It's very, it's a prefiguration planting. It's very simple, but very curiously, people like it and they think it's a park, which is good for us, by the way. So a few years after, it looks like this. What I really like, we use the tool of, you know, the countryside, poplars, groves of willows, and meadows. It's extremely simple, very familiar, but it was supposed to be the first layer of a park to be completed, to be more rich in the future. Maybe it will stay like this. And this is a view of the first stages, so like 20 hectares. This is a quarter of the park, it will be six kilometers long. And again, with this kind of very simple countryside writing. And of course, the purpose is to welcome new development on the bank, which used to be industrially used, and now it's going to be organized for people. And by the way, we convinced some urban designers. This is what you see on the, on the very center of the picture. So we could have the same kind of structure within the new housing in, into the new urban design. Another example in Bordeaux, still part of this chart. So I'm just showing you some example to give you some, uh, again, hope. 
This is a project we are developing with Rem Colas. And exactly as we did for the car park, this is a former commercial zone that will be turned into a um, residential area. And slowly, commercial, I mean, retails will be transformed into housing and landscape architecture, planting, are a very good tool to give quality to this place. So, I don't know if I'm going too fast or not. Somebody could, it's okay, they say, okay. So this is another project we developed with Herzog de Moro in Spain. It used to be a railway track and it's a, clear, it's a clear green on the bottom of the picture. This was a nine kilometer railway track that is transformed because they transformed the train system. And we were supposed to do an urban boulevard which is a kind of uh, lazy urban designer vision. You know, you put a nice road and two rows of trees, two rows of lampposts and two rows of benches. We didn't want to do that. We said, okay, there is a landscape and this boulevard will change according sequences. It's like a kind of natural geography. It has the same dimension of the riverbed. You could see the river in the very center. And so we transformed this landscape along the new road that is a substitution to the former railway tracks. So we did like this. So this is a part where the railway tracks have been removed, you have a way, but we transformed the landscape around it. It remains like a countryside. In the very center of the city instead, it looks a little bit like the railway tracks were, and we planted like a forest of oaks. What is very interesting is this was the rear part of the city, and now it is a kind of new um, facade. Okay, so still the same kind of, so you see, nine kilometers. And we, were, we won a competition a few years ago with Inessa Ange, a Belgian architect, and with SOM, a large, a big American firm, to transform a riverfront in Detroit. So this is a kind of poor rendering that shows that it's about, it's three kilometer long. It will be a development with some presence of nature. Everybody knows Detroit. Detroit is ruined, as you know, and um, to build a park in a void, of course, made no sense. So we had to build, I mean, this is not Bordeaux. It's a kind of negative of Bordeaux. Nobody in Detroit would have find uh, funny to purpose a void in a void. So we, we had to purpose a new development, but still keeping a real presence of nature. And on old <coughs> maps, we found that, of course, like everywhere in the world, there were rivers, affluent, and that we could play with this. And we found in the urban grid of Detroit, traces of all former rivers, of course, a little bit transformed. And this was the base of a structure for a presence of a park and for, again, a kind of park system. And so this will be a huge development, but still we have this kind of network that corresponds to a former natural geography within the city. And on the riverfront, so this is General Motors um, headquarters, you have new development, I mean like massing, of course, and the presence of this park will be like showing water because um, poor kids do not know to swim, they don't know nature, they don't move, so this park has to present the presence of nature. The, very, the river between lakes is extremely dangerous, nobody can go there. Another case, just to say something different. This is in France. Le Havre is a city that has been destroyed during the war. And it has been rebuilt by, sorry, it will come, Auguste Perret. It's listed to the UNESCO heritage. And we had to deal with Inessange as an architect on the white shape. And the cake is 1.5 kilometer long. 
and it is facing the industrial harbor. It is a public space, it used to be a car park, but we wanted to do it in a very simple way that fits with the scale of an harbor, not to over-design it. And this was a rendering where we had very simply a kind of tarmac area and a lawn area. Do not comment too much. Just to say, it's kind of completed today, and it's just done by tarmac Adam and grass. So, no special comment, accepted, this is in a public space, and it works incredibly well today, maybe this is not the best picture, and it is as simple, but it's very interesting that a void could work. And it has been inaugurated very recently, and now there is a crowd quite any time on it, of course during the day. There are big concerts, it's extremely simple, in a city a public space could be as simple as as cheap as this one. In reality, it's not really cheap. Um, this star macadam is polished. It's very special. Another arbor in Marseille, south of France. And uh, as it has been said, and this is interesting for landscape architect, as a landscape architect, I'm still leading a team that includes Norman Foster's team. And that's promising for us, landscape architect. Uh, Sometimes it is considered that landscape architecture is the leading theme for both engineering, architecture, design. And we won the competition just saying the white on the plan corresponds to the four, to, to the K, the river, the, yes, the K. Is the K an English word? Maybe yes. To the banks. And in green, on the left part, we said this should be a park system. It belongs to the army, and uh, on the very long term, this will be a park. And we won because of this kind of couple of an artscape with nothing and a large park. So the whole thing is three kilometer long. We won also this competition with a strategy for a refurbishment of public spaces on the whole city center. And so, I mean, the, the roads have been transformed. This was the first stage. But the bank is just a stone with nothing. And other competitors brought a lot of design. And we won with, we won with nothing, a void. And it's crowded any time, and it is enough. Scale is a main issue in landscape architecture. I mean, to, to, to understand the scale of a place is a difficult exercise. And by the way, I'm traveling a lot, 100 days per year, just because I need to compare places, because it's very difficult to feel the real scale of a place, the real spirit of a place as well. And in, in harbor, like Le Havre and Marseille, people are not scared by the void, because all around them, Industrial structure are much bigger than this one, so they are not scared by the void. Sometimes in cities, people are scared, and architects often, sorry, I have some difficulty with this, um, are filling places with a lot of staff. So, what we did is, just to explain what we did, I mean, before there was 75% of the surface dedicated to cars, and all this boat management was organized on the quay, and there was only 25% of the surface dedicated to um, people. We transformed everything, so 75% now is for people, and all the length of the bank is now publicly accessible. So Foster built this kind of small platform with crane and um, small houses for uh, fishermen and people with boats. Roads are limited and we just did these pavers and it's 20 hectares of stone with nothing. And then this is a park system, it's not done. This is a slow process. And then today we are working on all public spaces. Again, we did a chart 
that corresponds to prototype mockup. Of course, this is a map to explain we have to deal with existing situation and to define uh, parts, differences, because we had to deal with what already existed. I do not comment, but just to tell you it's a big project. Of course, I'm sort of um, embarrassed with such a picture, because in Prague, in Czechy, your pavers are fantastically done, it's beautiful, we spoke about this, and uh, we have a very hard time to imitate you. We, we cannot do it, I'm sorry about that. Okay, but we do it. <laughs> but not with the same kind of quality. To be serious, I, I'm very interested in these um, traditional practices. In Milano, by example, you have this fantastic big block of stones. In Prague, you have these very famous papers, which are different in Berlin. In Paris, we had Alphon and Haussmann, at the end of the 19th century, defined a language as well, which is extremely interesting. So I think this is part of a kind of geography for me. This ground of a city is something precious. Okay, so this is another project. It is a big scientific cluster south of Paris. We, again, as landscape architect, are leading a team that includes all engineers and an urban designer, which is Xavier de Gater, Xavier de Gater, a Belgian architect I saw um, manifesto in your place. So he did a lecture in your place a few years ago. Um, so it is a big site. Um, so in a few words, um, Paris was lacking a big campus like MIT. And we have interesting universities and schools, but they are spread over, they are dying, they do not compete in, you know, Shanghai um, story. So we definitely need to put this school together. And it's a very, very big project. It's seven kilometers long, but we have to think of, uh, on a wider way. Today, it looks like a countryside you will never believe it, but it hosts 15% of the scientific research in France. Because on the very center, I don't know if I can do it. Okay, you see this? This is a nuclear center for research. It has been done in the 60s by Auguste Perret, famous urban designer and architect. And, you know, it's very, very big. So everybody thought that only a landscape architect could help find a structure for this urban design development. <coughs> we have to consider three scales. So, the, so this helps you understand. So you see Paris, and this is the land we have to deal with. Even we had to think about the black perimeter. <coughs> Sorry. So, at a large scale, we did understand that in this very poor uh, landscape, we had interesting slopes covered by woods. These woods are protected, and in the landscape, they are building long horizontal line. And we thought this could, be, this could be a very big tool to organize the structure of this large cluster. We thought so because, again, in the past, in the US, um, Olmsted developed very large structure dealing with enhanced natural geography. <coughs> and we saw a last project in Washington. It's a large urban development, a large university. The name is Georgetown. It is documented, so we can find drawings and pictures of it. And the way they did was just to understand the traces of natural geography and enhance them. So we thought this was a good way. So one of our propositions immediately was to say, we will just enhance this natural presence of wood slopes covered by wood. It seems very light, but you know, it is so big that 
This kind of traces corresponds to two, three, four kilometers. And there is a kind of legitimacy, a natural legitimacy to this structure for this city development. And this helped us understand that this university, this cluster, will not be a single shape, but will be an archipelago. Why? Because there were existing structures, 15% of scientific research in France. And a lot of urban designers before us tried to make a single shape, a seven kilometer long new development, which is a monster. So we decided, okay, we will work by parts, and these parts are related, are connected by this natural geography, sorry, natural geography, and of, of course by transportation. But uh, at a second scale, we understood that something was missing. If you can see the arrow, I hope you do. This is the natural slope, enhanced. But we understood that we had to build, as they did in the US, a park system something that could really connect all these campuses together. And we purposed with urban designer to work with more density on developments to find spaces to build a park system. Because of course I forgot to say country size is protected we cannot build on top of it, of course. This is Tour Eiffel, this is Paris, just to help you understand where we are. And so this took us several years. First, to understand that there was a missing part. This small park system, seven kilometers, was a necessity. We were, in a way, blinded by our famous natural geography. And so they work with more capacity and we can do it. But today, it is very strange. Nobody thinks in our societies that we can afford a seven kilometer long park. The last big park around Paris has been built in the 80s. It has been drawn by Michel Corajou. It's 200 hectares big. And from this time, no big park have been built. And this is something very important to be noticed. On the 20th century, cities have been growing incredibly, but it looks a little bit like an uncontrolled process and no big parks have been built in France. I don't know about Czechy. So we cannot afford a park. So how to do a park with no means? So <coughs> the gray corresponds to natural geography, and this is what I'm mentioning. We did understand we will have to enhance what exists. We have to deal with all means to build this park. What are the main tools we have? The main tools are water management. As soon as you build a big project, you have to manage water. And also big to, and you, so you need surface, you need money, or you put it on pipes, or you keep it. By regulation, we have to keep it by chance. A second very big tool are environmental compensations, ecological compensation. As soon as you build a, 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 um, a big development, you will have to compensate for wetland, forest, or I don't know, a lost animal. This requires surfaces, this requires mean, and it's a very good tool to do something. We also have to deal with research surfaces for agriculture because this campus will host uh, agricultural houses and agricultural research. So I do not comment too much, but we could um, develop this park dealing with water management. Very simply, dealing with agricultural means. So this will be a reservoir, as they did in the past, and you see what, to what it corresponds. I mean, it's very small, but this is a Renzo Piano school, by the way. And these are the first step of a park. It's not a park. At this very time, it's the water management, on top of which, with more means, we will do the park structure. 
So, you know, just to realize this is like 1.5 kilometers. I mean, what we have under the eye, this to this. Very simple reservoir, so what, and they are used for research as well. This geometry corresponds to agricultural structure. You, you can see these traces. So we will reinforce the agricultural structure that has been destroyed by industrial agriculture. <coughs> and this is a rendering showing how it will how it will look like later. Because what will be a public use of a park mostly will be path. Nobody can afford this. We can do it because we are finding solution again economically for water management and compensation. So water management. This is another part. This is a three kilometer long kind of park where we deal again with water and ecological corridors because building all this transform some batration uh, itinerary. And believe it or not, but we can find a lot of means for batration, which is nice. So you see the kind of work we are doing. So water management and ecological compensation under construction, of course. Of course, main road system. This, this is a development, a part of it. So water management, ecological. This is not going to stay like this, of course. This is a chantier. This is a way to, to do it. There is already water, but not park. The park is going to be built now on top of this. And it takes, you know, I started this 10 years ago. It will take 15 more years. And I really like this time. And it's not a kind of cute park. It's really a kind of infrastructural management of a land. And there is a readability of it. One could understand roads. One could understand water, because, of course, it moves according rains. And there are already batration. This is an ecological corridor where we are trying to deal also with agricultural structure. Now we are dealing with another scale, which are the public spaces scale. And speaking uh, this afternoon, we said usually we start by public spaces, the trees on piazza, the trees along road, and maybe one could have thought to the large landscape. You see that in this case, we are addressing three scales, large one, so the geography, natural geography, second one, park system, third one, public spaces. And this is one part of the campus. This is 2.5 kilometers long. And we just want it to be compact, but like a forest, a little bit like some um, Altos project. Just show you where we are. I mean, it's something under construction. We have been planting already 12,000 trees. It's still strange as a place, but there are already students, including my daughter which is a family issue. OK, so another project now. Um, it is in north of France, where we, we used to have very large mining areas. And um, you probably know that Katsuyo Sejima, Sana, built um, a small museum for Le Louvre. And this was an opportunity to transform the land, to redevelop this land that has been abandoned 40 years ago. So this is a kind of place. Katsuyo Sejima built our museum here. And um, we were commissioned, again, as landscape architect, leading a group of engineers and urban designers, including Christian de Porzampart, that you probably know. And um, all urban designers, until now, were trying to, to fill all voids. Voids corresponds to spaces between former mining concessions. It was organized like an archipelago for industrial reasons and concurrency reasons. So we said this void is very important. And we, we have to organize a kind of park system that will help densify the city. So please don't fill the void. Give quality to the void in, gray, in, in, a, so in such a way you could give more density between the voids. 
And we observe that during the mining period, the companies build these kind of dikes for trains on which nature has been growing and it's very interesting structures that could be developed. So we have been looking at this, thinking this is something we could transpose within project. I will lose several times this word of transposition. So, and I, and I think about landscape architecture is something very French in a positive way. And Michel Corajou, my old professor, did it. I mean, invented it this. You look at the existing situation, you understand it. And you do understand that all shapes, all components are related to practices. Once you understand that, you can transpose it in a new project. A project in landscape architecture is always a transformation process. To transform, you have to understand what exists and to, of course, transform what exists. So this was a tool we had in mind. So building a new path, new railway, new, sorry, bicycle track, new road with trees to recompose this territory, to do new shape for parcels, to build them. And we produce this plan. Again, a square should correspond to, I don't know if it's 500 meters or one, is it probably yes, because it's a stadium, maybe more, maybe one kilometer. So it's big. Sorry. And so all this light green corresponds to new structure organized like path. And as you see, this path help define new parcels to be built. And um, these are the parcels that could be built. So a big redevelopment. This was a prototype for the opening of the museum. We could, we had to do new accesses. And so we did I don't know, a few kilometers of path. We planted 5,000 trees to start as a big prototype to recompose this territory. And so we did so, and it works. I mean, today, it, it, so we planted trees in a very dense way, micro wood, if you want, micro lane of wood. And, um, and now the city start to build all along. Again, it looks very simple, it's very rustic, and um, this is important. The quality of this landscape was this kind of authenticity. Nobody, no landscape architect found money to do a funny design. So we could just transpose what existed before and find the correct scale for this. But we planted 5,000 trees and it costed the first mock-up 20 million. Okay, then we were asked to think wider. Uh, all these old mining deposits, mining companies were abandoned 40 years ago and they slowly have been transformed into park. And speaking with politicians, we found that this could be a fantastic park system to link all these parks together to build for this old region at a wider scale, like 30, 40 kilometers long, a structure and so this was accepted, and this colors corresponds to big park. It's a recomposition of existing park, creation of links between them, and this is going to be the kind of big framework for the whole redevelopment of this mining region. And uh, it's strange because it's sort of very popular. We call it chain de parc, park chain. And um, everybody wants to be part of it which is strange, so they did marketing. What is not marketing is a physical action on it. So I spoke a lot about transformation, about this kind of transposition, looking at what exists and transposing it in a new condition. Even in the desert, even in very strange countries like Qatar, we could do so. We were asked at the first time to do museum gardens with Jean Nouvel in Doha. And we did understand that there was a language. There were, the desert is not a void. There are natural phenomena like um, rivers. When it rains, it rains hardly. And you have dry rivers, but sometimes not dry, like this, Sapka. Sorry, I'm wrong. This is a kind of lagoon. This is a, this is a sea. This is agriculture. 
even in the desert, sometimes man tries to keep moisture to develop some agriculture. There are shapes, there's a language, there's a culture. And this is a dry river. Along a dry river, sometimes there is water. And because there is water, there is some kept moisture that helps some vegetation to grow. And so we developed this garden museum with these three parts. It has not been totally completed, but this laguna has been done. Okay, these are renderings. It's a restaurant project. This is a laguna. Okay. Then, in the same place, we, with Rem Colas, we had to develop some uh, university's shape, and we did, dealt exactly, you see, with the same thing. Um, dry rivers, agricultural structures, and this gives a framework of the university development. It's very simple to be a landscape architect, but we have to be very rigorous. To, it's not a decoration. It's really an expansion and enhancement of what exists, both natural geography and human practices. We have to be very careful with this. And this, you know, if you do a, a landscape that looks fashion, if you think that it will take 30 years to do it, and then 30 other years to make it grow, in 60 years, your fashion landscape will be totally has been. So it doesn't mean that you have to be has been first. It means that you have to understand what exists on site and just play with what exists on site. I mean, very long historical structure, natural geography, that is something so important. So we developed also in Qatar a very large development streetscape and we, we used to work with pocket gardens, so I do not comment this. But this has been done in the Netherlands after the war by Aldo van Eyck, famous architect after the war. He transformed demolished buildings into squares in Amsterdam. And we did the same, no wars, but um, in Lusail. Everything worked with a lot of prototypes. With Remcolas again, we did a kind of highway landscape, trying to avoid, you know, the kind of decorative and decoration along an highway. And we purpose just to enhance both natural geography and some agricultural parts. This didn't work. I mean, we won it, we did it, but they don't care. Okay, we did with Jean Nouvel again, so it's a long story in Qatar, uh, a large project to transform the Corniche. It's sort of big, it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's probably this is three kilometers. And again, this was a transformation process of an existing um, geography, okay. And we were asked to do a part with Yao Ming Pei for the Islamic Art Museum. And we did this, I mean, which is a kind of pseudo dune facing the sea they did first a kind of pseudo-naturalistic thing. We did it in a transposed way. That's very important. How to deal with nat nature is a big theme. Of course, we are not at the 19th century, and the way we are looking at nature is a transposition, of course. What was interesting for us was the slopes. The slopes facing the sea, and the valley between the slopes that welcome some bar and cafe. And it's a, it's a place that is very popular now. And all people doing at night are coming, you know, I'm speaking about when it's very hot, because it offers an interesting situation along uh, the seashore. Again, transposing natural geography on a site. A big park that is under construction now. And um, it's a three kilometer long park along a dry river and a laguna, and I've been observing, sorry, I observed this landscape in Qatar, which is beautiful for me. You know, this is a laguna, and on this sand, uh, I would say that, I don't know it in English, but on this sand bed, there are housing, and people built all these bridges, passerelles, dams, to reach them. I love, again, this, uh, connection between water, natural phenomenon, and construction. And we purpose for this dry valley to reorganize banks and 
dams. So how to capture some moisture, as they did in agricultural uh, practices, into this park. And this was a picture of the site under construction. Today it's a city, big as Lyon, one million people. It's true, but, and the park is not completed, but quite. Okay, I don't know uh, what time is it. How many times do, do we? Half an hour? Okay. Okay, 20 minutes. Okay. So I will speak about more simple project. I should have started by this. I'm looking at you because we had this interview first. Uh, and somebody asked me, you asked me, um, if I have to say to some kids, what is my profession? Probably I would start by this. So I had to do a garden. And this was in, really, I was just, I mean, I was in Villa Medici and with Christine Dalnocchi at this time, we had to do some uh, courtyard for Renzo Piano. This was uh, challenging in a way. And uh, we had this idea to say, okay, in this courtyard, we should just have a wood of birches and uh, 100 birches. And the path will be just, just a kind of projection of one of the Renzo Piano's facade. We did this project after a lot of other projects done by colleagues that Renzo Piano didn't like. So, so of course, he accepted this one. If not, I would not be here. And um, it was very new at this time in France, you know. Just a wood of birches in the city center in a courtyard. It was a kind of... I was playing with, in a way, a nature, a microforest. It was not over-designed. So it was just path and trees. Of course, after my family is from Russia, I've seen in Russia a lot of similar things after. I didn't travel before. And in Sweden, and in East, I mean, East, former East Germany. <coughs> I don't know your country enough, but I'm sure you had this kind of landscape. And it's fantastic to have a forest in the very center of such uh, housing. Why? Because the density is big and the <coughs> proximity between apartments could be an issue. Because of this presence, it's very, very different. It's still alive 30 years after. Of course, we had very cheap means. And as an example, we are very young. And we bought, we didn't bought, we, we had the opportunity to ask clients to buy an abandoned nursery. So these birches at the very beginning, this was a picture from the very beginning, were nine meters high, they survived. And there was just some bricks, it was very cheap. I don't like this ground cover, I would do something different today. <coughs> Sorry. As an anecdote, when we finished this, we were immediately sued by the client <coughs> because he couldn't recognize a tree. You know, in a classic garden, in a courtyard in France, you would have had real trees, trunk, volume, <coughs> and like an object. And this was a kind of nothing for them. It didn't look like a garden. So this was our first um, justice, contact with the justice. Then we have had a lot. And by chance, this won a big prize, so we were happy and they, they, they forget us. Okay, this is a museum parvi, piazza, museum piazza. It, it was supposed to be artscape. This is a Yao Ming Pei museum in Luxembourg. And we convinced Pei to add 600 trees on top of this piazza. And it is like a forest. And as you can see, the artscape is a kind of mixture of... Um, it's a very special technique that helps have both artscape and nature. And today it's a very successful um, place. Okay, do not comment. 
This is one of the smallest garden we did. I should have started by this one. So it's a culture minister in Paris, I mean offices. It's 170 square meters wide garden. And we started with Patrick Blanc. You probably heard about these guys. This is a botanist that invented the uh, uh, walled garden. I mean, the, the, sorry, vertical gardens. And thinking about this Parisian courtyard, he did realize that the climate condition of a courtyard in Paris are very similar to what happens in a s underwood of a um, mountain forest in Australia. You know, climate, I mean, temperature, moisture, light. Of course, we would not plant the 100 meter high trees, only everything else. But this is very interesting because even in winter, this is a winter picture, you have a lot of flowers, presents. So it is not an exotic, it's not a collection of exotic plants, it is a recomposition of a milieu, of an ecosystem in a way. And somebody in my office has been working one year to find 1,000 plants of 100 species absolutely unknown in our country, not all of them, by the way. And this was a big mess, to be honest. Because, okay, no maintenance, they didn't understand what it was, and some trees died, again, justice processes, and we had to do another one. But this was very promising, because with climate change, we have to adapt our species, as we know. But the way we do it is species per species, like changing object. Instead, we have to think about the adaptation of ecosystem that corresponds to a new another latitude. And I do think we will have to deal with wood in this way. And it was nice. I mean, it could have survived, to be honest. This was just a kind of uh, stupid justice practice. This was how it looked like in winter. And this was three days after completion. And this is very interesting because a forest is organized by layers. You have like 10 layers in a forest of plants. And every layer was organized by plant. All these plants were done, there was 1,000 pots organized in three days by workers. I really like this idea of recomposing a milieu with our artifices. So everything died. And we, no, not exactly, but some of them died. So we did another one, which is more careful. It's a re reconstitution of a small forest around Paris, but like a miniature, and it is enhanced. There are some exotic plants, like a Japanese maple, which never grows, of course, around Paris, naturally. But it was very interesting because a miniature of a forest is not nice. You had to bring some miniaturization in species. So we have had to accept some percentage of exotism. And it's exactly what ecologists are thinking today. For to compete with a new condition, with disease, we should not be so uh, rigid. And we have to bring a part of exotism today. This is what they are developing right now. This could be a debate after, if you want. And about aesthetic, this is very interesting for us. So it's a little bit transformed nature. I, I, I do not comment this one, I'm sorry. Just this will be a piazza with a lot of trees. And bricks, okay, nice. And water. By the way, this is Austrian architect, Baumschlager Eberle. And it's a big, big campus where everything is artscape, plus trees, plus water and plants. Okay? So I will speak a little, if I have time, I will spend some time on this, which is very interesting today. This is in Tokyo, in Japan. No, this is not the one. I will speak uh, next. So I'm sorry about this start to be tired. So, so this is a small, this is the first university campus in Tokyo, Keio University, and it used to be a garden died by um, Noguchi. These Japanese are not so precise, so they built a building on top of it. 
And uh, the Noguchi Foundation in New York asked us to do something about this garden. So we do a new garden on top of this new building, but we didn't want to imitate Noguchi, so we just kept the shape, the space, the dimensions, the proportions, but we evoke nature with our means. So it's all an artscape with dots where plants are growing. But this is the one I want to develop. So this is more recent. This is very close to uh, Imperial Palace in the center of Tokyo. And um, in this very center of Tokyo, I'm just speaking before, because after it will be complicated. In the Imperial Palace, there is a big park. In this park, the empire in the 80s decided to recompose a kind of forest because all forests in Tokyo are vanishing because of the growth of the city. And they did very interesting experiment, experimentation. They brought soil, everything, roots, uh, trees, plants. They really removed a part of a forest in the very center of this imperial palace garden. So then they are developing this uh, surrounding area, which is a big business center. And you can densify it. This is urban design regulation if you plant a part of this primary forest. So I was asked to do one hectare of this primary forest and I didn't understand anything. But I did. Okay, so, so this is a forest, but I want to develop it. Um, I don't have all picture, I'm sorry. The way we did it, we pre-planted it with a botanist from this imperial garden on mountain. So the garden has been pre-organized during five years and then we removed it in one time. And this is exactly how it looked like the first day. And this is the same day, but inside. And it's very interesting for us because it's a kind of forest. I don't speak about the composition, which is in a way Japanese. But the interesting thing is this is an extremely dense part of the city of Tokyo where a main station is built underneath. So think about it. It is an artificial ground. Underneath you have a main metro station. A crowd is walking anytime and it looks like this. So this is the main entrance to this metro station. And this is a f at the very beginning of it. I've been there last summer and uh, it's growing and growing very well. Of course, climate helps. Everything artificial and very densely used. So it is possible to build this kind of forest in a very in the center of a city. Okay, this is a message. Okay. So another project. This is a, a, a development in Belgium. Everything is done on top of a garage by very good uh, arch Belgium architect. And this picture is taken the first year. Okay. And maybe this will be one of the last pictures we will see. Uh, in the very center of Paris, there is a main university built in the 60s. And um, there is a tower, and, a, and this was a kind of piazza, a very artscape. But the way it was built in the 60s, sorry, 60s and 70s, was very light. You cannot really build on top of it. And we did a garden on top, but with 10 centimeters of earth. So if there are questions, I will explain you how. But the main purpose was to change the typology. This used to be the main piazza of a university, and now it is a garden. It was a risk. It could have been a mess. I mean, nothing, maybe a wrong idea, because everybody was thinking this piazza, I was, I mean, the some architects were absolutely fighting against my proposition. But it's very successful because the garden, again, with narrow path, works extremely well. I've been teaching 20 years at Harvard, and um, the main public space, civic space at Harvard is a garden with narrow path, and it welcomes thousands of students every day and during events. Okay, I'm stopping here.
No, uh, of, uh, a few words. So I'm working in. Um, no, no, I don't want to make it in a bad way. So it's a very young project. There are some architects present here. So we will show it in a very precise way later when it will be developed. But just in a few words, it is a red spot. It's between your cemeteries. We want to complete a kind of forest again, despite a big quantity of buildings, like in Tokyo, exactly. So these are the footprint of the buildings. And we are developing a kind of urban forest around it. That's finished. And next time, I will show you more precisely what it will look like, how it will look like. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, I believe there will be some questions. I hope there will be some questions. So, I may have... Yes, please. So it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> no, you have seen there are some trees and the, there is a ground cover. And um, usually when you put trees on top of a slab, you put a pot. And what we did are these kind of eels. I'm back to the picture. It will be easier for you. So, so when you have such a tree, you have a cone of ground because it's on top of a column. Of course, on column you can load, but everywhere else I could have or people or 10 centimeters of earth, nothing else. Because regulation, physically it could be more, but regulation have been changing in time. And today such a slab couldn't load um, more than 10 centimeters of earth. So we made cones of earth, and then we have to put 10 centimeters and so this is something that will be shocking for you. Everything is done in polystyrene. This is a plastic garden with 10 centimeters of earth on top of it. And it's perfect. We have a lot of scientists here that all agree they like it, it's natural. No, I'm joking, I'm tired. But seriously, it works very well. I mean, to do such really helps load on very precise point. And this ground cover helps find this continuity. And paths are organized between this kind of very light, small uh, topography. So it's not poetic anymore. Polystyrene. This is young, this is today. But it grows very fast, I mean. So you can imagine how it's done. And it really works very well. So of course there is an irrigation on 10 centimeters, a permanent one. And it could be a discussion. So, of course, this is a university that hosts a lot of scientists, and we discussed a lot with that. But the climate, I mean, the improvement of the climate conditions that bring such a garden is very important. So, of course, it consumes some water, but it is a big benefit for the whole climate condition of this university. So, it has been conceived as a valid option, despite the artifice of it and despite the consumption of water. It really improves the climate condition. And uh, if I'm going further, I did this, and I did this garden in Tokyo, and this interested a lot the Paris mayor, and we are developing now some project, I didn't show you today, with Richard Rogers' team, with a big urban forest in the very center of Paris, and the city commissioned me to work on urban forest in Paris. And I think it's very interesting. It's a, these are gardens. I mean, the words are a little bit uh, exaggerated, but these are gardens with a certain typology that really helps improve the local condition for climate. Another question. Um, 
Hi, uh, I would like to ask about the landscape infrastructure projects that you showed in the beginning. Um, was uh, where was the source um, the, of the demand for the project? Was it um, direct commission or was it competition from the municipal level or regional level or maybe even national level? What was the process behind it? So, so, so sorry, I cannot see you. Can, can you? Because it, so I don't understand. Can you start again? Um, I'm wondering what um, the landscape infrastructure projects that you showed in the beginning, the, the mini forests and path systems, what was the source of the demand? Was it the municipality or was it the regional scale level or maybe a national okay. interest? So, so that's a very interesting question and we have had the same kind of discussion a little bit late, earlier. Um, it's, I mean, this kind of commissions 30 years ago didn't exist at all. And we all, we, of course, we are speaking about public commissions. These kind of projects are always public projects. No private people is going to improve a city, of course. <clears throat> so classically, for landscape architect, like as for an architect, you would have had first a program, then a budget, then a competition for both project and program. And uh, we have had to invent a lot of, I mean, not only myself, but the profession, have had to invent a lot of new kind of commissions. Because in general, when we started, like in Montpellier, we suggested this to the mayor. So in Montpellier, this has been really uh, going, um, I don't know, a little bit par, par hasard as we could. So there was first a kind of um, a master plan, then a guideline, then some prototype. Then we have to work with um, the public um, services, I mean the city with, is, with its own means. But in more recent cases, there has been a new kind of commission. The name is, I have no translation to that, Accord Cadre, means it's a kind of menu of possible commission. So this is part of the competition process. Competitors are putting prices and method about a list of possibilities of actions. And then according needs, during a period like eight years, 10 years, the client decide with us to uh, develop part of this menu. And this has been a very strong improvement pro for our profession because it allows us to work during 10 years, sometimes 20 years, because you could have a second project with a competition process again. And it gives a strong flexibility in uh, the way project is going. Not, not uh, its architecture, but on the time management, because nobody knows exactly where it's going to start. So your question is very important. I mean, landscape architecture, time management, long, big dimension, do not correspond to the classic competition process for architecture. So we have to improve it. We have to invent it with, of, of course, with uh, our clients, with our public clients. Uh, but there have been big improvement in my country uh, about this. And it's extremely important for you, like landscape architect. I mean, I guess that with European institutions, it will be easy to, to use what happens in other countries. I have no ideas about what exists in Czechy today, but it makes real sense to understand what happens in other countries and to purpose this to uh, authorities. These tools are very efficient and not that expensive for, um, for, for the collectivity. Uh, hello, it's, I'm Jana Piškova, landscape architect, and I would like to ask you if you could explain uh, what are, in your opinion, advantages of landscape-led solutions in large-scale projects. I, I don't understand the question. Like, uh, when, what are the advantages uh, of projects when they are uh, led by landscape architect? 
Oh. Okay, sorry, I didn't understand first. Now I do understand better. <laughs> so we we have had a, we, have, we have discussed about everything this afternoon, but on you see, like in Saclay, um, in French situation, a few decades ago, the team would have been led by engineers. So you would have had a, a road network then urban designer would have defined blocks between the road and at the last moment a landscape architect would come to put some trees in the middle of this. Maybe you could say the result is the same, but what, what was very different in the US with the park system is first one look at the geography, then he, enhance, he enhances this geography, building a framework. But these frameworks give a re um, give reasons also for the location of road. So, it, so the roads in the U.S. are parkways, and they are dealing with this understanding of natural geography enhanced. I hope my English is understandable. And then urban design comes. And between this geography, this enhanced geography with roads in it, so it's nice to drive because you are in a nice place, you are not on a road where you don't understand where you are, you really, you don't need a map, you understand where you are going, it's going according a slope. And um, water management is organized by the landscape vision. Of course, you put water with this topography. So. Landscape architectures gives coherence, this was a word I was looking for, to both um, engineering, road system, water management, and of course, urban design, not at the very end, but at a certain point, because this defines the places where you can build. It's a huge difference. A land, a coherent landscapes give coherence to everything. In our country, where functionalism was very strong after the war, you would have had first the road system, then an urban designer, and I repeat it, at the very last time, possibly, and maybe not often, a landscape architect making a, a kind of decoration. So now we have been doing big progresses in our countries, and um, you know, like Saclay, it was clear for any client, any uh, civil servant, that landscape would lead all other professions. And it's not a power issue, it's a kind of, I mean, this was a kind of 19th century heritage improvement. Of course, our two wars have been destroying this knowledge. And we have been recovering for 40 years, so now it's going better. And uh, I mean, intellectually, we, we, we are back to what was already invented at the very beginning of 20th century. How did you persuade the traffic engineers uh, to give give you the priority in the projects? I mean, uh, personally, I, I cannot do that probably, but but I mean, no, it was a public commissioner, and now after, the, uh, I mean, very optimistically, there is an understanding of this, and these teams work well. And uh, I forgot to say that, of course, ecology, is a point as well. But what I would say about this, I mean, at the very beginning of my career, I didn't like ecologists, you know, because they were um, kind of, uh, this was about prevention, this was about protection, this was not about a productive vision. While I started to teach in the US, I understood they had very different thinkings. And ecologists in the US are sometimes extremely pragmatic and they like to do projects, you know, like water treatment, uh, phyto remediation. So ecology could be an engineering way to, to work. And today, so I forgot to say that, in the same kind of process I mentioned, of course, they are ecologists. 
uh, dealing with and hydro ecologists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, a lot of engineers are working, and we all understand the coherence we are building. So it's not a, a kind of new power given to one profession. It's sort of very obvious for everybody that there is a coherence, there is a physical coherence, and and there is a project together. So, so it's organized around a project. And I must say that now I'm really working well with ecologists. It's really interesting. Thank you for a, a great lecture. Uh, I feel a little controversy about the, the last set of projects you showed us about the forests in the in the very uh, center of the cities. I hope you don't mind if I raise these concerns. Uh, first, I'm wondering, um, by making these uh, forests in the very densely uh, built and inhabited areas, you actually make these areas um, inaccessible, right? There are places that cannot be accessed by public anymore. And the second, um, I'm thinking this is really not in line with the, your philosophy of uh, like enhancing or magnifying uh, the natural geography, because last time um, a dense forest was on uh, on such side was maybe hundreds, thousands years ago. So I'm wondering like um, how you deal with these dilemmas, whether whether you deal with them. Mm. Thank you. Okay, so there are two parts in your uh, intervention. So the first one about, of course, doing so, there are parts that are not accessible, which is the case on every garden. I mean, in a garden, you would have places where you don't go, but you are right, it's a key question. And on every project, we have to, to balance accessible and not accessible places. But again, I was very convinced by, her, I mean, I've been a lot at Harvard Yard, where you have very, minimal hardscape and it works, it welcome a lot of people. So it, this is a question and it corresponds to a composition where we have to balance these different uses. About the second part of your question, um, it depends on scale. I, I mean, uh, like in Tokyo, every forest like this one is very small. So nothing very serious about ecology. But now, in these Otemashi places, there are not only one, but a lot. So it starts to be a kind of system, a micro-system. So it's not scientifically very rigorous, of course. It is a garden, it has a certain texture, a certain presence. But as soon as it starts to be a, a system that is multiplied, it has a certain value. So this is a kind of decor in, very, in city centers. But I'm working now, I forgot to say that, in Sweden. So, sorry, the lecture will be updated in, the f in a few years. Um, in Sweden, close to Malmö, there is a very famous campus about an agricultural school. And um, a landscape architect, the name is Gustafsson, did during decades experimentation about small forest, urban forest. I, I see people that know it. And it's very, very interesting. I mean, he did with students exactly what I did in random according some opportunities I have had, but they did it on the campus. And they developed a lot of thinking about urban forests in the northern countries. And as an example, what they call urban forest is not, what, is not this kind of decor. Uh, on what we call very, very negatively urban sprawl, they consider it positively as an urban forest. And it's a little bit shocking for us because we are fighting against urban sprawl. They show that this kind of urban sprawl with a lot of forest is extremely interesting about climate change conditions and could be extremely interesting. So, of course, it could be clever or not, it could be interesting or not, but they made a lot of scientific evaluation about the real improvement it brings, how many degrees it helps save, etc., etc. For the moment, I'm not able to understand it. It's shocking. It's exactly the opposite about, I said that to a mayor, a big mayor um, in Bordeaux, a guy that during decades had been fighting against this. I told him that these Nordic 
scientist shows that maybe we are wrong. And so this is a debate. Somebody explained as well that if traffic conditions are changing with new kind of vehicles, more autonomous, etc., etc., maybe we should be careful with an excessive density we are building today. So it's not what I'm doing. I'm doing excessive density because I'm old generation. But I'm listening to the scientists from the north and maybe we should think about it. So there is not one good solution, of course, but not to be too um, radical in our thinking. So I don't know, this was not exactly an answer because I went in another direction. But back to this campus, just to say, of course, you're right, this is a decor, it's not exactly what I was speaking about, large scale project. The addition of it could bring to a certain large scale. By the way, in Paris, there could be really hundreds of hectares like this. Not in the very centers, it would be stupid because there's a cultural, but on the suburbs. And we did a, a, um, a study with Richard Rogers' team very recently showing that if we plant this along motorways and railway tracks that are going into city, in, into the city center, it corresponds to, I don't remember exactly, like 300 hectares of forest in the very center of the large scale city, the Grand Paris. We, we have to do that. So we are speaking with politicians. They all agree, but they don't do it. We don't do it. They, they do nothing. But as a collectivity, we should do this today. If we just plant trees along, but this kind of small forest along all our ways, like they did in the US at the 19th century, this is a very interesting improvement of our conditions. So again, this is just like a prototype. It could be developed along infrastructures and the addition of it could bring some quality. Then, for younger generation, thinking about improvement of suburb, it's something interesting. So you should go to Sweden, not to France. I think this is this was the last question. I thank you very much for the lecture once more. Thank you. And there's a little certificate for you okay. as a little remembrance of everything. Okay. okay. And thank you for the questions. They were extremely interesting. And uh, okay. Thank you.